right. Welcome to Chapel Hill Church. Somebody praise the Lord. Come on, let's make some noise in this place for everybody that loves Jesus. I don't know if you know this about us, if you're visiting with us, but this is not a quiet church. We, we make noise in this church. We make a little sound in this church because we just believe that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks and shouts. And so I just believe God's going to do something incredible in this new series that we're in. Uh, we're starting this series today. Behold. The king has come. Before I get into today's message, I just want to take a moment and remind everyone in the room and our online audience about some times for our Christmas production and Christmas Eve. So as you saw a moment ago, our Christmas production is coming in two weeks. And let me show you the times. We've added a Saturday night on December 16th at 6 p.m. for this, the joy of Christmas, a musical celebration. And then also you'll see, you'll notice that on Sunday, December 17th, we've changed slightly, modified our normal times to 9, 11, and 1 p.m. So make sure uh, you grab some of our invite cards on the way out to not only remember our times, but to use those to invite others, your family, your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers, to come to this special time, and we just know they're going to be blessed. And then also, check this out, on Christmas Eve, it's on a Sunday this year, on Sunday, December 24th, at 10 a.m., we have one morning gathering, and then we'll do our traditional 4.30 p.m. and 6 p.m. Christmas Eve uh, service. So please make plans to be here, and if you forget the times, don't worry. As always, you can just go to chapel.cc and you can see all of our service times there. All right, so as we begin this new Christmas series today, behold, the King has come. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for what you're going to do in this place today. We thank you for what you've already done. And Lord, we just look forward through this entire month as we journey through this series. God, open our eyes to see, open our ears to hear, open our hearts to receive a word that would change us from the inside out. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And somebody with faith said, Amen. It's the most wonderful time of the year. It's the most wonderful time of the year. That's much more than just a classic music, uh, classic song that we sing and we hear on the radio. It's, 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 it's true. This really is the most wonderful time of the year. But let me ask you a question. Why? If we were to ask different people in the audience or in our church, I would probably get varied responses and answers. Why is this the most wonderful time of the year? Like, if we were to ask our kids, most of our kids would probably say, uh, obviously it's the presents and the gifts under the tree. <laughs> if we were to ask Amazon or anybody really in the marketplace, why is this the most wonderful time of the year? They would probably say, money, 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 money. If we were to ask Will Ferrell in Elf, he would obviously say, Santa! <laughs> but what about for us? What about for Christians? What about for believers? What about for disciples and followers of Jesus? Why is this time the most wonderful time of the year? Well, I think it's this. I think it's for this reason because for us, somebody say, that's me. For us as believers, this is the time that we celebrate the coming of the King. And it's during this time that we all get to behold Him. Now, I know the word behold is not probably, probably not commonly used in your everyday conversations, in your vocabulary. I get that. But the word behold is used a lot throughout the scriptures, Old Testament and New Testament. And it's derived from the Greek word ido. And this word, the literal translation of this word is this, be sure to see. In other words, don't miss this. Be sure to see. Behold. And we're just saying in this series, because we know there's a lot of things to see around this, this holiday season. There's, there's, you know, plenty of, you know, decor and the lights and with all the shopping and with all the parties there's there's a lot to see but we're saying in this series be sure to see this don't miss this what are we talking about the king has come let me give you some bible today luke chapter 1 verses 30 through 33 this is the beginning of this amazing incredible story and the angel said to her do not be afraid mary for you have found favor with god and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, 
there will be no end. This, ladies and gentlemen, was good news. <laughs> this was good news. This was truly something to behold. Be sure to see this. Don't miss this. And, and the good news would continue in Luke chapter 2. Look at it with me, verse 10 and 11. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And so the good news just continues to unfold. The good news just keeps on getting gooder. <laughs> and we see that as Jesus would grow up in wisdom, stature, and favor with God and with men, we see John the Baptist paving the way for our king. And one day as he was baptizing people, look on the screen in John 1, 29, it says he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Behold, don't miss this. Be sure to see this. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So this is the most wonderful time of the year because we celebrate that the king has come. But follow me here. We also anticipate that the king will come again. Revelation 22, 7, look at it. And behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Ladies and gentlemen, what I'm showing you through the scriptures today is what Advent is all about. In Advent, the church stands between two proclamations. The King has come and come, Lord Jesus. So, so we get to look back in celebration while at the same time look forward in anticipation. So this Christmas series is really an Advent series. Advent is the season encompassing the four weeks leading up to Christmas. And Christians from all kinds of backgrounds and denominations around the world celebrate this time of Advent with reflections on four things. Hope, peace, joy, and love. And so in this series over the next four weeks, that's exactly what we are going to do. Each week we're going to focus on one of these four things, hope, peace, joy, and love. And so today I want to take a few minutes to talk to you about hope. When I was a kid, I, I, I thought Advent was just like the name of the calendar with the chocolates inside, okay? And so I, I, I didn't really understand, and, and if I'm being totally honest, as I grew up as a child, I, I really, the most exciting thing, the most hopeful thing about Christmas for me was obviously the presents. It was the gifts. It was the, getting up in the morning and unwrapping those gifts with the family around the tree. That's what I looked forward to. That's where my anticipation was as it is the same, you know, with many children. I was looking forward to the gifts. And I, I remember all the way back to the first grade, y'all, okay? This would have been December 1991. Okay, you just be quiet on the front row, okay? <laughs> December 1991, I remember I was in the first grade and my class was having one of these secret Santa gift exchanges, right? And so you, you know how it goes. If you've ever been a part of that, you draw a name out of a hat, you get the name and you don't let that person know that you drew their names. You get them a gift and you get to surprise them on the day of the gift exchange. And so, you know, I remember that in December of 91, really the, 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 the hot toys, okay, were action figures. Action figures. Like we all, all the boys especially, like we were hoping for one of these action figures like the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Wrestling action figures like Hulk Hogan and Macho Man Randy Savage. Oh, yeah. We wanted like some of these starting lineup figures like you see MJ, Michael Jordan, the GOAT. I remember on that day in first grade, one of my friends opened up and pulled out that exact starting lineup action figure of Michael Jordan. And so all of my friends are opening their toys and, and I'm waiting with hope and with anticipation for who drew my name, who's it going to be. And then my classmate Andrew walks up to me. And he handed me my he hands me my gift, and I knew something was wrong when he said this. I hope you like it. <laughs> and this is what he said. He said, because my dad worked real hard to make it. I thought to myself, is your dad one of Santa's elves? Like, what are we talking about here? Like, 
and I ripped out the tissue paper out the bag and pulled out one of these, a wooden car. <laughs> didn't even paint the car, didn't put a sticker on it, nothing, just a plain Jane wooden car that was going to win no race with everybody else's Hot Wheels they got, you know. And I was visibly upset about it visibly upset and all the kids and all the parents were there and there I was in frustration and anger and you could see it now before you judge me okay for being rude and ungrateful you got to understand I was seven and I didn't know Jesus yet okay <laughs> I was upset and I remember Andrew's mom, she came over with a big smile on her face. Don't you love it? My husband worked so hard out in his tool shed. And I thought, no, woman. I wanted an action figure like everybody else. Come on, give me Michelangelo, Donatello. Come on, like something. Not a wooden car. I'm not supposed to do with this. And then, and then my grandma who was there, she, she saw this whole thing going down. So she came over and she kind of just walked up behind me. <laughs> and pinched me on the side, right in the small of my back, just pinched me. Anybody else got that same mom and that same grandma? And she said, you better say thank you. And I said, no, I refuse to be thankful for this. <laughs> I was so disappointed. Nobody else got a wooden car. Everybody else got cool toys. I mean, the rules were clear. You spend $10. Just go to Toys R Us or Kmart. That's where we went back then. I'm old. I get it. Let's move on. I was frustrated. I was let down. But hear me. Uh, all was made right a few days later. Because like every child on Christmas morning, I woke up when I arose from my slumber. And I walked down the long hallway of my grandparents' home to the Christmas tree, the lights twinkling, those old school little icicles hanging, dangling off, you know. There was this one gift that I had my eye on for days, possibly even weeks, because it was the right dimensions of the thing I had been asking for, hoping for. I would pick it up and shake it and compare it to when I was at the place where I was, you know, it was like, this seems like it could be the one. And so I rushed into the living room, and I opened up the gift, and, and it was there. What I had hoped for, what I had dreamed for was there. It was the Nintendo Power Glove. Wow. Now, some of you may not know about this, but back in 1991, okay, back in my day, this was, was breakthrough technology that you could harness the power of gaming in your hand. Forget a little game pad, joy pad. You could literally take this glove, and I saw this on the commercials. You could take the glove, and instead of steering the car with a remote control, you could steer the car with your actual hand. I mean, this was way before the technological advances of virtual reality and motion controls in gaming today. I mean, the ads, they captured my heart when they said things like, everything else is just child's play. And so my dream... My goal, my aspiration for this Christmas was that, 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 that somebody, hopefully grandma and granddad, would place it under the tree. And all my dreams came true. My hope was fulfilled. And I ran to my bedroom with my power glove, and I plugged it into my Nintendo Entertainment System. I left all the other gifts under the tree, and I said, I'll get to those later. I have to put the glove on my hands. And as I began to try to play my video games with the power glove, I realized within about 30 seconds, that this thing was horrible. <laughs> that all the ads led me astray. That, that this thing was horrible. They sold one million units and there were one million disappointments because the ads made it seem like it was so easy to use. The, the controls were horrible. The most controls were garbage. I mean, it was, it was so bad it became just something to go to the side of the room and I quickly lost interest. I was devastated. Oh, don't laugh at me today. I, I, was, I, was, I was devastated. I, I was let down. I was disappointed. And I share that funny story with you today. It really is just a simple story to prove this point that all of us know what it feels like to get our hopes up about something. To think about what something could be and then have our hopes dashed. We all know what it feels like to imagine the way something's going to pan out in our lives, in our families, in our journey, only to be let down, only to be disappointed. So this story is just a simple example of where many of us are. In fact, probably even some of us are there right now today. 
where we hope for something only to be let down. We, we all do this because we place hope in all kinds of stuff. Can I, can I talk here for a minute? We, we place hope in all kinds of things, really in people, in places, and in things. We have misguided hopes, misplaced hopes. Some of us are putting hopes in our government. Some of us are putting our hopes into an opportunity. Some of us are putting our hopes into our money. And this is important to talk about today because where we place our hope is imperative to our experience of joy. I'll say that again for the people in the back who missed it. Where we place our hope is imperative to our experience of joy. So my question today is, is what is your hope in? And before you say what you know the answer is, oh, Jesus... Take a real long look at really what you're placing your hope, your trust, your dependence on. So much so that when it doesn't work out the way you wanted it, hoped it, thought it would, you're disappointed. Because again, where we place our hope is imperative to our experience of joy. And we all use this word hope. It's not like that word behold. We, we all use the word hope all the time. We say things like, I hope my team wins. We say things like, I hope my team still makes the college football playoff and they're announcing it right about now. Don't check your phone. I'm preaching the word. <laughs> I hope I can shed these holiday pounds easily. I hope the in-laws leave soon. <laughs> Somebody say, well, hallelujah. <laughs> But the way we as humans use the word hope is, is way different than the way the Bible uses the word hope. It's very different. See, see, when we use the word hope, we are using the word hope most of the time, the majority of the time, based on probabilities. Like, you know, if you're a college football fan and you're anticipating this announcement that's about to come at any short moment, I'm not looking at my notifications, are you? No. It, it is, is we're watching these, these shows of these analysts and these commentators talk about the probabilities that your team will make it in the top four. And they're analyzing. And, and we're putting our hope in a probability. But biblical hope is not based on probabilities. It's based on promises assurances certainties 100% it's going to happen why how could you say that because God said it would happen and when God says it will happen it will happen when God says it's gonna happen it's gonna happen when God says it will be it shall be hear me it will be it shall be Romans 15, 13, look at it with me. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that, here's the point, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. May the God of hope fill you, receive this today, with joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. What am I saying? I'm saying my hope is not in this world. My hope is not in other people. My hope is not in opportunities or promotions. My hope is not in my investments. My hope is not in the doctor's report. My hope is not in my current situation. My hope is in the God of hope. In other words, my hope is not based on probabilities. My hope is based on promises because when God makes a promise it must happen it will happen what am I saying I'm saying this his son really will return his strength really will be made perfect in your weakness he really will work all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes I'm saying this you really are forgiven you really are made new you really are a new creature today he really will work all things things together. I need somebody to hear this today. You really can do all things through God, through Christ that gives you strength. If you believe that, you ought to praise God. May the God of hope fill you today. May the God of hope fill 
fill you with joy and peace. Hear me. If God is for you, he's more than the whole world against you. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. No weapon formed against you shall be able to prosper. This is my hope that he has promised me. He has given it to me. May the God of all hope fill you today so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, this is what it says, by the power of the Holy Spirit, not your power, not your strength, by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. See, one of the greatest reasons we have to have hope for today or even tomorrow is what God did yesterday. See, see, the reason why we can have hope in hopeless situations is not because we're just wishful, wishful thinking. No, no, no. The reason why I can have hope in the face of adversity and hopelessness and despair is because I have learned even at my young age and stage of serving God that the power of adjusting the rearview mirror on my life and looking back over my shoulder and saying, God, if you did it before, you'll do it again. God, if you saved me out of that thing, you'll save me out of this thing. God, if you healed me over here, why wouldn't you heal me again today? God, if you were faithful when I thought there was no way out, but you brought me out and you set my feet upon a rock, I still trust in the God who redeemed me, that he'll keep on redeeming me, that he'll set me free, that he'll redeem me from the curse and the law and all things that the enemy is trying to do in my life. Hear me today. This is not just wishful thinking. This is not just being an optimist, seeing the glass half full. I don't see the glass half full. I see the glass overflowing and running over. My cup runneth over. He will be good. This is not just optimism. It's not blind optimism. It's blind faith. It's I don't have to see it to believe it because I trust it. My hope is not in the things of this world. My hope is in the Lord. Somebody give him praise right there. My hope is in the Lord. Why? Because he was faithful before, so he'll be faithful again. I'm reminded of the story of Abraham. You know Abraham was promised by God an inheritance. He was promised offspring, a child. And, and a decade plus goes by, and Abraham and Sarah have no children. And they are, at this point in the story, they are well beyond childbearing years. And, and Sarah's womb was barren. And the Bible shows us this story where God shows up while Abram and Sarah are in the tent. And, and it says that God brings Abraham outside of the tent and says, look up at the stars and count them if you can. The point is, Abraham, you can't. God was trying to elevate his awareness and expectation to a God that if he can hold the universe in the palm of his hand, what could he do with this situation and problem and struggle? What could he do if you would place this trial and this tribulation in his hands? So he's, he says, look up and, and count them if you can. It reminds me of when God pulled Job aside and said, where were you when I created the stars? It's about perspective. And God wants to remind us all today that we have a reason to put our hope in him. Because ultimately, he's in control. And he's going to work this thing out. Abraham and Sarah finally would have that child. And when God gave them that promise, you have to know that that did something to their faith. In fact, when God promised Abraham again and he reminded him by asking him to look up at the stars, it says, Abraham believed he believed, he put, and he placed his hope in the Lord once again. And it says this, it was credited to him as righteousness. And so much so we even call him the father of the faith still today. That he trusted God, hear me, with no evidence. He trusted God even in the worst case scenario. Even in a situation where he's saying, okay, God, I hear you saying that, but I'm looking at this. And me and Sarah, we've been in the tent for a while. We've been trying. She's getting older, so am I. I'm just saying, you know, like, uh, don't look like it's going to work out. But he still believed. It may not look like it's going to work out today. But I came to encourage someone. In the midst of hopelessness, your hope isn't in that thing anyway. Your hope isn't in the report. Your hope isn't in the bank account. Your hope isn't in what's happening to you or around you. Our hope has to be placed in the one thing 
that we can stand firm on. And I apologize for being simple and elementary today, but hope has a name. And his name is Jesus. My hope is in the Lord Jesus. Behold, the king has come. Some of us struggle, though, don't we, because we place our hope in the wrong things. Some of us, we place our hope in what we can control. And this can hurt us and cause us to have pain because if I can control it, then I don't really have to trust. But if I can't control it and I don't have control over it, then I, I'm frustrated and I'm anxious and I'm dealing with this tension of I can't control it. And God says it wasn't yours to control anyway. The way I can really trust God is in the middle of situations that I feel like I am totally helpless and I have no control over God. My hope is in you. I don't know who I'm talking to today. My hope is not in, thank you, sir. My hope is not in my money. My hope is not in my opportunities. My hope is not in my relationships. My hope is not in my accolades and how many letters I have after my name on that, on that piece of paper on the wall. My hope is in one thing, the Lord Jesus Christ. Abraham and Sarah received that child. And then if you know, probably one of the most famous, popular stories about their journey is when God himself asked Abraham, take your one and only son, the one you love, the one I promised you, take him up on the mountain at Mount Moriah and, and bring him as a sacrifice. And in those days, he knew exactly what the Lord would have meant. He's asking me to literally take my son on a mountain and kill him. And so just imagine this, Abraham packing up with his son. Now, I know some of us, we got this cute idea in our heads that it would have been little Isaac, you know. No, if you study this, the timeline here, he would have been like 15-year-old Isaac that he had to get to come up on a mountain to sacrifice him. Now, folks, it's hard to get a 15-year-old to go to the store. <laughs> Much less, where are we going, Dad? Don't worry, I'll tell you when we get there. Well, what's the... What's the rope for? <laughs> whoa, 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 what's, what's all this stuff about? What's the, the whole dagger situation? Like, are we, are we hunting or like, uh, and then for Isaac to willingly, I know we give Abraham a lot of credit, but for Isaac, think about that, to, to willingly lay on that altar. We got to give him some credit in the story too. And the Bible says, and I'm moving fast here, that Abram, he, he lifted his hand to, to kill his only son. And God stopped him because he, he got what he wanted. He wanted to see his heart. He wanted to see his willingness. He wanted to see that he would trust him. How could Abraham be willing to kill his own son? Because somehow, some way, he trusted that if God gave me a promised son, then God will be faithful. That even if I kill him, God would resurrect him and bring him back from the dead see we've got to get to the place like Abraham where we can say God if you were faithful yesterday you'll be faithful today you'll be faithful tomorrow God though you slay me yet will I trust you I've been walking through this this trial this struggle this tribulation this dark time but even in the dark night of my soul, I trust that you are the light at the end of the tunnel. And in this Christmas season where so many of us are looking and gazing at lights, let's remember the true light of the world that we put our hope in. His name is Jesus. Can you say amen? amen. This is why I trust, not because it's, it's always easy. Can I just make it really plain and really real for us? Let's, let's, let's just ease the tension. Do you know it's okay for you to be frustrated? You don't have to walk around, you know, just glad that you're walking through a tough situation. No, 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 that's, that's not what this is about. In fact, sometimes it's even okay, and I can prove it by Scripture, to, to even be a little angry at the devil. There is this thing as such thing as righteous anger and righteous indignation. If there wasn't, then Jesus wouldn't have been able to flip those tables over when they were acting crazy in the church, making it about the wrong thing instead of the right thing. So if the enemy is attacking your family or your relationships or, or your relationship with God, and he's, it's okay to be a little angry. It's okay to be upset, but take it to the Lord. 
Do what David did. Open up your heart before the Lord in this season and say, God, I don't understand. I don't know why I'm going through this, but I want you to know my hope is in you. Though I'm walking through the valley of the shadow of death, I believe that you are the light and you are the hope, and I will trust you through it all. See, I'm rushing now. But as I get ready to land the plane today, I want to ask you this. Where was Abraham's hope? Was it in a circumstance? Was it in the, that, the potential outcome? His hope was in the God of hope. So as I get ready to land the plane today, let me just ask you, how does this play out in our lives? Because the hardships have a way of overshadowing hope. Walking through difficulties has a way of overshadowing hope. The key is we have to remind ourselves that Jesus is the object of our hope. That's the only way you'll get through this with a smile on your face and joy in the middle of it. It's not the situation. It's not the preferred outcome. It's not other people. It's Jesus. Hear me, things won't always work out the way we hoped for. Like me on Christmas morning in 1991 as a first grader, there will be times where things will happen and we will honestly just be disappointed, disgruntled, maybe even upset, maybe even a little angry. But whatever you do, don't lose hope. Because can I say it this way? To live without hope is to cease to live. Years ago, I heard a phrase and it stuck with me. If you ever had one of those phrases here, and man, it just, you carry it with you. I read somewhere that a man can live about 40 days without food. That a man can live about three days without water. That a man can live about eight minutes without oxygen. But a man cannot live even one second without hope. Romans chapter 12, verse 12. Let me encourage you as I get ready to land the plane today. Paul writes, and he encourages us by saying, rejoice in hope. Rejoice in hope. Watch this. Be patient in tribulation. This is going to require patience. There are times where it's not going to happen the moment. How many of you know God's timetable is not ours. My timetable is not the Lord's. Be patient, he writes, in tribulation. Watch this. And be constant in prayer. If you're going through a dark season, if it seems hopeless, let me encourage you in the way that Paul is encouraging us as believers. You've got to rejoice not in your circumstance, not in what's happening around you. You have to rejoice in the God of hope, and you have to be patient through the tribulation. But you must not miss this last part. You have to be constant in prayer. In 1 Thessalonians 5.17, it writes it this way, that, that you have to pray without ceasing. Don't push God out when it seems like God already left. When it feels like you can't sense him, feel him, trust him, know that he's there, that's even more a call to say I'm going to draw near to God. And according to James 4, 8, when I draw near to God, he will. That's a promise, not a probability. He will draw near to me. So where is your hope today? I hope that you are feeling this the way I am that I'm deciding to place my hope not in this world, not in my situation or the outcomes that I would have preferred, but in the God of hope through his dear son Jesus. Behold him. Don't miss this. Be sure to see this. Have you ever heard this concept of the Christmas blues, the holiday blues? Sociologists and therapists use this language around the holidays when people go through a, a dark time. They go through this season where they should have happiness and joy. And a lot of times it starts right after December 25th as the presents have been opened and the decorations come off the tree. And the meals that we are sharing together are no more. That this depression and despair this dark night of the soul, they call it the Christmas blues, sets in. 
And I think for people who experience that, it comes back to the simplicity of my message today. That our hope, if we're not careful, can be placed in all the accoutrements of this season. And not in the real reason why we're all celebrating. I refuse to take Christ out of Christmas. Culture may want to do it. Schools may want to do it. Other religions may want to do it. They may want to say happy holidays. No, it's about Christ. He is the reason. Without Christ, we wouldn't have the lights and the trees and the wreaths. And we wouldn't have any of this. This is what is central during this time. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I'm out of time. I want to pray with some people today. As we're in this Advent series and we're talking about hope and peace and joy and love, I want to I want to remind us today, with heads bowed and eyes closed, what it says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Just listen to this word. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us, hear me, to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. My hope today is alive because where my hope is, is is in Jesus and according to 1 Peter he is the living hope my God is not dead so my hope isn't either my faith isn't either and through darkness may the light of our Lord shine brighter than ever before in your life with heads bowed and eyes closed, maybe you're here today and you don't know Jesus as the light of your world, as the Lord of your life, as the Savior, as the King that he is. I want to encourage you today to make him the King, to make him Lord. According to Scripture, it says this, that if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. This is the most important 60 seconds of the entire day today, giving people who are hopeless the opportunity to find hope. If you're joining us online and you just happen to log on or someone sent the link to you and you're needing Jesus right now, this is your moment. It's for you. I want to lead you in a prayer. For anyone in this room that needs to pray this prayer, maybe you're visiting with us today with family or maybe you just came for the first time and you realize, man, God brought me here. This is a divine appointment. I couldn't agree with you more. This is the moment that you need to say, Jesus, I choose you. Above all else, I place my hope, my trust, my faith in you. With heads still bowed and eyes still closed, would you just simply pray this prayer with me? whether it's for the first time or maybe you're praying it again because you realize you've gone your own way and it's time to recommit, reconnect, recalibrate your spirit to the Holy Spirit and say, Jesus, you're my portion, you're my peace, you're my hope. Father, right now I thank you for my brothers and sisters that may be praying this prayer. I ask that you would move in this moment in power and let them sense and feel the everlasting love of our God. If you're in this room and you want to pray that prayer, I can't pray it for you, but I can certainly lead you. All you have to do is just say, Lord Jesus, start right there. Call him Lord. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, I believe that you lived a life with no sin, but you also lived a life where you came to us to feel what it felt like to be one of us. That, Lord, you were fully God, but also fully man, and you came and wrapped yourself in flesh to experience temptation and emotions and what we feel. Oh, what an amazing way to love someone. How can you love someone if you never place yourself in their shoes? You never feel what it feels like or consider what it must feel like to be them. That's what God did. When he sent Jesus, he expressed his love by saying, I'm going to come and feel what you feel and experience what you experience and see it from your lens. And when Jesus lived this perfect life, the Bible tells us that he went and he died a death on a cross. So when he died that death, he didn't just die for you. I like to say it this way, he died as you. In other words, he took your place on that cross because we all deserve death. We all deserve, according to Romans, we've all fallen short of the glory of God because we've all sinned. And Jesus paid that price that we all had to pay for the wages of sin is death. He died that death on that cross. So if you're praying, would you pray this with me? Say, Lord Jesus, I believe you died for me. 
I'm so thankful that you died for me. You took my place. You paid my price. Tell them, say, Jesus, I believe you did that. I believe you rose from the grave with all power and all hope in your hands. And today I choose, tell them, say, I decide to follow you now. I believe you died and rose. And now I believe the best decision I can make is to be a follower of you. So say, Jesus, you're my king. Jesus, you're my Lord. I'm going to follow you now all the days of my life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, the Bible says if one person prays that prayer, heaven rejoices. Come on. At any chance we may have had someone pray that prayer today, come on, let's rejoice with them. If it's all right with you, I'd really like to close today's message by calling us to worship the Lord for just a few moments to this song, that he is our living hope. That's the words we're going to sing. So I'd like to ask you right now all over the room, would you just stand up on your feet? And if you're going through some dark times, if you're going through a hopeless situation, you might just want to lift your hands real high in the air as we sing these words. Come on, Christelle. Hey, and hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Hallelujah.